Um, good morning, my name is Glenn Vanderberg. I work for Relevance, um, and uh, this is my third year to speak at, at Lone Star RubyCon. Um, I'd kind of like to, to be like the Nathaniel Talbot of uh, Lone Star RubyConf, be the guy who's spoken at every one. Um, but uh, you all hear that buzzing? No? Okay. Yep. So um, we've got somebody, I think maybe our sound is turned up too loud or something. Um, so last year I gave a talk here called Tactical Design. Um, and uh, I was talking about something that's been interesting to me for a long time about you know, teaching and mentoring programmers and, and helping them become better programmers. And um, just the, the talk this year is Programming Intuition. And in a way, it's a sequel to the talk from last year. And um, so since that's true, I'm going to start off by recapping a little bit of what I talked about last year. How many of you were here last year for my talk? OK, less than half the room. So it's worthwhile uh, going over it again. So this is a picture of sort of uh, the programming world. And, and we've got a, a few programmers who are really, really good and a lot of programmers who are average. Um, and we, we don't really know uh, if, if the picture really looks like this in its entirety. It's, it might not be a power law distribution. It might be a, a bell curve. Um, but, but the important thing is there are a whole bunch of average programmers and uh, a few really good programmers. And uh, studies have demonstrated over and over again that the productivity difference between an average programmer and a good programmer isn't a factor, or an, and a great programmer, isn't a factor of two. It's a factor of 10 or something like that. And um, so great programmers are hard to find, and, uh, but they're worth a lot if you find them. And for most of the history of our field, um, the strategy of management and tool builders and, and everything else has been, let's see how well we can do, let's see, see you know, if we can figure out ways to get acceptable results out of a bunch of average programmers. And our community, the Rails community, is, or the, the Ruby community, and even more so the Rails community, um, is partly a rejection of that idea. Um, it's more like, OK, let's cater to the great programmers and see what we can achieve. And in fact, when I quit my last sort of you know, corporate IT job, and went off to do Ruby work, I remember telling people this, that I was really tired of trying to figure out uh, how, to, how to get marginally acceptable results out of a horde of, of average programmers. I wanted to go off somewhere and see how well we could do with a bunch of great programmers. And I still think that's the right approach. But um, the world isn't two buckets, right? The world isn't, there's this bucket of great programmers and the bucket of, of average programmers, and you're either one or the other. There, there's people all along that spectrum. There are people who are pretty good, and they're maybe three times better than the average programmer. And um, I think if we're going to take this attitude of let's cater to the great programmers, I think we have a responsibility to see if there's any way we can help the people who might kind of sit on the knee of the curve. Right? Um, I don't believe that the way we teach programming either to brand new programmers uh, in school or uh, to new employees trying to learn our way of doing things at a company. I don't believe that the way we teach programming really has much to do with the techniques that, that differentiate an average programmer and a great programmer. And I think the great programmers today are the ones who either care enough or have the aptitude or something and were able to somehow figure it out all by themselves because I don't think we do anything to teach people to be great programmers. But I also think that the people in this bar, or this band of the graph, they might not be the people who can figure it out all by themselves and, and lift themselves up by their own bootstraps, so to speak. But they might be people who could learn how to be better programmers and sort of climb that curve a little bit. If only 
we could think clearly about how to teach them to do that and, and try to start teaching people to be great programmers instead of just teaching them to be average programmers. So last year I talked about tactical design and the one slide summary of the talk um, is that I recommended instead of great big design patterns and large flighty principles that deal with your whole code base that, that you focus on teaching and working with three very small tactical principles that you can apply uh, at the level of classes and methods and individual lines of code. Uh, do one thing, uh, dry, don't repeat yourself, and uh, the single level of abstraction principle. Every method should you know, contain stuff that all was, is at the same kind of level of abstraction. So last year's talk was all about what you can do to become a better programmer or to help teach uh, average programmers or maybe uh, programmers who show a spark of more than average, uh, how you can teach them to do better work and, and be better programmers. This year's talk is in the same vein, but instead of focusing on techniques and what you do, it's focused on how you think and how good programmers think. And so I want to start off, um, which is why I have the audio feed hooked up, I want to start off with a clip from um, an interview with Paul Graham on the Econ Talk podcast uh, about three or four weeks ago. Um, and the, the interviewer was asking, uh, it, they, they had talked about venture capital and, and various other things. And the interviewer was, interviewer was asking Paul Graham um, about his uh, earlier book, Hackers and Painters, and what prompted him to write that book. And I hope the volume doesn't blast you out of your seats. I'll be quick on the volume buttons. Let's, let's listen. Writing software. Um, what made you good at it was not what would make a scientist good at science. It was more like it was more like what would make a painter good at painting, um, or m most closely probably what would make an architect good at architecture. Right? Like what makes an architect good is not a command of statics. <laughs> you know, it's something a little less uh, organized than that. Um, I think that's true. What makes an ar architect good is not a command of statics. But I think we teach programming as if, you know, what we think what makes a programmer good is a command of, you know, programming languages and design patterns and, and sort of these more scientific approaches to things. But what really is happening is a lot, as Paul Graham said, a lot less organized than that. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about my theory of one of the things that's going on. Um, our brains are wired and organized and, and designed for what? For interacting with the real world. Huge portions of our brains, uh, up, probably upwards of 85 or 90 percent of the, the tissue in our brain, is devoted to processing sensory input. Sight, sound, uh, touch, smell, taste, and um, and yet we deal with in, pro in the programming world, we deal with things that we can't see, and we can't smell, and we can't taste, and we can't touch. We deal with abstractions. And a very small portion of our brain is you know, capable of dealing with that. But one thing I've noticed, I know a lot of great programmers, and I talk to them a lot. And I've been thinking about these ideas for a number of years since uh, I started talking about them with Dave Thomas at lunches seven or eight years ago in Dallas. And, um, one thing I've noticed is that great programmers all talk about code as if they could see it and feel it and touch it and smell it. And what I've decided is that one of the things that really good programmers do is we find ways of roping that big part of our brain that's heavily optimized for dealing with the real world. We find ways of enlisting that part of our brain to help us in the job of thinking about abstractions. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the first thing I, want to, uh, I need to do is sort of uh, justify my claim that there's these huge parts of our brains that are doing, doing sophisticated things with uh, perceiving the real world and helping us understand it. And I'm going to do that by talking about music. And I want to show you two videos. Um, and both of these videos, I think a lot of people in here may have seen already. 
um, because uh, I'm sure we read a lot of the same blogs and follow the same people on Twitter and things like this. And um, these are both things that I've come across in the past few months. Um, the first one is uh, a video from the World Science Festival um, of Bobby McFerrin uh, teaching the audience about the pentatonic scale. Talking about expectations? Expectations. What? It's about two minutes. How many of you have seen this? Last night, uh, Dave Thomas challenged me to not show that video, but to instead do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I refrained. Um, and you're all grateful for that, although you may not know it. So uh, I don't think that that video necessarily proves that the pentatonic sca scale is hardwired into our brain. Um, there, there's probably some cultural things going on there. Uh, he goes on to say that he can do that sort of anywhere in the world, and, and it works the same way. Um, but uh, I, I do think uh, pe the pentatonic scale is a primitive scale. Uh, it appears in uh, early music uh, in the West, and it appears in music of almost every culture around the world. And, and so I do think it shows that there's something deep going on there. And um, these are the actual notes that he sang. And I, I was explicit about the, all the accidentals because um, the pentatonic scale kind of predates our modern notion of key signatures and things. And that's it kind of spread out. And um, the, the peculiarities of the way we map notes or pitches to the keyboard and the staff um, are such that that picture doesn't really show you the relationship between these notes. So those are actually the frequencies and wavelengths of those notes as they're, they're typically found on a modern day instrument or piano. And um, if you graph those, it looks like this. Uh, interestingly enough, this is the second talk in a row where we have a graph that's first shown on a linear scale, and then we switch to the logarithmic scale. <laughs> and uh, uh, you see it look like that. And, and it's not quite a straight line. And the differences are, um, for those of you who have a musical background, the differences you can put down to uh, the notion of tempering uh, in the way we tune things. Um, but what that shows is that uh, in our understanding of that scale, our brains are doing some, some rather sophisticated signal processing and analyzing frequencies and, and showing their, we, we have an innate understanding of 
musical of, of sound frequencies and their relationships to each other, and uh, we can do some interesting things with it. And, and one more quick video to show uh, a little more of this, and this is one that I, I uh, Marcel Molina posted on Projectionist uh, in June. Um, there's a guy who uh, does really interesting animations and visualizations of music. Uh, uh, the, the incredible music animation machine or something like that. And uh, um, most of his animations look like kind of piano rolls. They, they have you know, the notes that are being played and, and how long they sound um, scrolling across. Um, this one is really interesting. Um, he shows all the notes that are played, but at any given moment in this video, um, he, uh, he has all the notes that are currently sounding are connected with lines. And those lines are colored based on what kind of interval it is, how, how far apart the notes are uh, on the piano. And um, a little, just, you know, tiny bit of music theory, uh, um, musicians or composers, uh, part of the way we respond to music and part of the way composers make us respond to music is by building tension and then resolving that tension later. And... Um, uh, a lot of what's going on with, with building tension and then resolving that tension is the use of different kinds of intervals. And the intervals here that are colored blue and green are called harmonic intervals. And uh, there's a reason we use the word harmony to describe uh, peacefulness and, and uh, in lack of tension in other realms beyond just music. Um, those, those intervals sound nice and peaceful and, and harmonious and resolved to us. And then the, the purple and yellow and red are dissonant intervals, and they sound tense and harsh. And um, so um, I've chosen just the last minute and 10 seconds or so of this video, the conclusion of the piece. And I've chosen it because Chopin, uh, in the course of this minute and 10 seconds, takes us through five distinct tension resolution uh, cycles. And even if you don't have much of a musical background, I want you to, to pay attention as you listen and pay attention to the points where, you know, well, you know he's not done yet. He's building up to something. And you'll notice there's a lot of purple and red there. And then the point where, well, you know, this would be a good place to end if he wanted to do it. It's, we we kind of got everything wrapped up. And it's all blue and green. Just watch. You see that? You feel it? Isn't that a cool video? Um, so one more little bit of music theory to emphasize and underscore what I'm talking about is um, harmonic intervals um, have a fairly well-defined mathematical relationship with each other. And the, the frequencies and or the wavelengths of tones uh, that are used in harmonic intervals um, share common factors. Um, so it's a really complex uh, relationship between those wavelengths. Um, so our brain is doing fairly complicated signal processing and it's all happening fast in real time and we exploit that to understand and react to 
music and have an emotional response to it. Have you ever met programmers who don't have an emotional response to bad code? And don't have an emotional response to good code? But think about the great programmers you know. Bad code makes them cringe. I mean, you can watch physical reactions. And I don't think it's just play acting. I think, I think it's, it's uh, good programmers have learned to feel code and the relationships that are in it. One of the reasons I started off here with, with music is that there's a well-known kind of correlation between people that have musical training and programming talent. It's not a strict one-to-one -one thing, but it's a statistically significant um, uh, a relationship. Um, why do musicians make good programmers? And um, I, I, I've always had kind of two theories about this, and Dave gave me another one last night. Um, my, my big theory is that um, I think that, uh, you know, as a musician, how many of you have any kind of musical background or training, by the way? So, well, over half the room, good. Um, as a musician, you learn to make mental mappings between a notation and an abstraction. You're looking at blobs of ink on a paper, uh, on a piece of paper. And you, in, if, if you're good and if you can sight read, um, and if you're really good and you can just look at music and hear it in your head, I know a few people who are like that, um, you're looking at these blobs of ink on a, paper, on a piece of paper in two dimensions, and you're mapping that to tones and tempos and hearing that in your head, and it's, uh, you're mapping it to a sophisticated multidimensional structure that you, uh, in some cases, see and in some cases, hear. Um, and you can also map that in real time to finger motions and, or coordinated finger and, and breath uh, action and things like that. So you, you learn this practice of mapping um, sort of you know, flat, abstract 2D notation into uh, more sensory uh, and, and motor, the concrete world, essentially. Um, Dave pointed out that um, uh, musicians also can look at something that is static, a representation on a, a page, and understand how that becomes dynamic, something that changes and moves over time, and has its own both a static structure and a dynamic structure. And um, that's very important, actually, because in that, in that Chopin piece, part of the reason we feel it, that, that last chord, that last little simple harmonious chord of that piece, if I just played that for you, if I had played that one part of the video, that would have sounded nice, but nothing special. What made it really a good conclusion to the piece was the memory we had of everything that had gone before and the relationship that that final chord had with everything that had gone before. So just like programs, music has both a static structure that we can look at directly and a dynamic structure that we have to visualize and perceive all in our minds, because we can't be uh, in all those times at once. Um, I want to show you a, a few examples of good programmers talking about code and in some cases about just the real world. Um, and I'm going to do that by showing tweets. Um, Kathy Sierra retweeting from somebody she follows, uh, listening to an old LP on a turntable. Didn't realize how, listening to, realize how listening to MP3 for so long has numbed the experience. And then she apparently got in a conversation about this. The more we digitize, the more we value non-digital things. I love combinations like chumby and ambient. Dan Steinberg responded to that. We can see it in little kids and their attachment objects. We are wired to be drawn to physical objects. One of the, the programmers I know who is most uh, evocative in his use of physical analogies to talk about code is Michael Feathers. Don't you hate it when your closure captures a variable and you extract method and you have this long strand of mozzarella hanging? Which is funny, but I know exactly what he's talking about. 
right? Brian Foote responded to that. I've always thought of closures as being a bit like flypaper. They're inside out. Um, and then this, uh, Kevlin Henney retweeted, re retweeted something from somebody he follows, and it started a great conversation between him and Dan North. Um, getting a method signature with generics right always feels like solving a Sudoku puzzle with Java classes. <laughs> and Dan North responded, Generics are more like balancing the legs on a wobbly table. An extra angle bracket here, one out there, step back, and squint. Which makes your IDE a kind of spirit level. When the wiggly line disappears, you're level. Right. Another one from Michael Feathers, which I think gets to the root of things. Often I think physical analogies in computation are more than just analogies. The infinities in math distract us from them. So, I want to talk about, I want to tell three stories about cases where people have given concrete form to the abstractions in their systems and sort of the, the interesting results about this. Um, Fourteen and a half years ago, I heard uh, Michael Weiser, um, Mark Weiser, sorry, uh, give a keynote talk at a Usenix, Usenix conference. Um, and he told a story, uh, he worked at Xerox Park. Uh, back in the heyday, and uh, he told a story. They had a visiting researcher there whose name is um, Natalie Jeremy Jenko. You may have heard of her more recently. Um, she she does uh, weird and fascinating work with like feral robots and, and stuff like that. But uh, uh, she was working in Xerox Park, and she built this thing she called a dangling string Ethernet monitor. It was a, and this was back in the old days of. Thick coax, uh, thick wire coax Ethernet with transceivers. You had to bolt on to the things, and so she. There was a in the corner of her office. There was a, an Ethernet cable running through um, the ceiling, and so she went up in there and bolted a transceiver on and hooked up to that transceiver a little box she built, um, and it it had a, a servo motor in it, and she glued a piece of string about six feet long to that servo off center. And then she programmed it so that every time a packet came by on that segment of the Ethernet, it would twitch a quarter turn. And so usually this thing would sit up in the corner of her office dangling down there just kind of lazily twitching. But uh, when, you know, then, you know, during parts of the day when things were pretty busy, it would, it would kind of spin, you know, it just kind of twirling around like a lasso over in the corner. And then when they had a packet storm, it would spin so fast it would howl, and you would hear it all over the floor. He said it was like internet weather, <laughs> right? But it gave them an awareness of something that they usually didn't have an awareness of, and it helped them come to understand. This was, Xerox Park was where ethernet was invented, remember? And this was happening during the very early days, and it helped them understand um, how to build protocols and, and the, the effects of some of the things were going on because they had this tangible uh, representation of what was going on uh, that had previously been invisible to them. Um, a second story comes from Paul Graham again, um, back in the days when he was uh, with ViaWeb, uh, which was the startup company he founded that later became Yahoo Stores. And uh, so ViaWeb had a bunch of servers, and um, they, you know, would periodically have problems with those servers, and uh, sometimes it was, you know, things kind of going haywire on the network or packet storms, and sometimes it was denial of service attacks and things like that. But um, one of the guys who worked for ViaWeb took a piece of plywood and a whole bunch of um, sort of uh, control panel style gauges and built a control panel for their server room, and there was a gauge for each server, and the gauge showed the, the CPU load on that server at any given time. And they mounted this on the wall outside the server room. And um, from where Paul Graham sat, his desk was in an office right across the hall from this, and, and he couldn't see the thing. But um, it, was, it was still pretty close to him. Uh, and those gauges were operated by servos and they would make a little noise when they, uh, when they changed. And, and they'd make a, a louder noise if they had to change a lot quickly. 
And he said that um, every now and then something would happen and it just sort of denial of service attack or a packet storm on the network or you know processes going uh, wacky or something. And all of, this, all of those gauges would peg uh, all at once and he could hear it from his desk. Oh no, something went wrong. And um, uh, it, was, it was using a kind of passive awareness that we all have of things that are going on, you know, that we don't usually pay attention to, and he he was able to instead of having to, um, you know, be constantly checking uh, logs or or uh, load levels or or things like that to watch for these problems, he could devote his full attention to his work and count on his uh, hearing, uh, his audit auditory system to clue him in when something was going on and he needed to context switch and jump on a server problem. The third story is one that you've probably all heard, um, which is uh, the, the guy, the story Mike Clark tells about the guy who hooked up lava lamps to his cruise control uh, server. How many of you have heard that story? Oh, not as many as I thought. So, the um, guy was working for this, this software team and he, uh, they were using cruise control to continuously integrate and, and everything. And, um, they they kind of had a problem with, um, you know, the build would break and people on the team wouldn't care. And so this guy went out and bought um, uh, one of those little X10 kits for, uh, you know, remote control over power lines. And he bought two lava lamps, one red and one green. And um, uh, hooked them up and, and, and set it up so that when um, the build was good, the green lamp would be on and the red lamp would be off. But then when the build broke, it would flip and turn the green lamp off and turn the red lava lamp on and set these up in, in some place in their workroom. Um, which, you know, is cool, making, making you aware of, of what's going on. But just as with the other two examples, the real world has these kind of nonlinear, uh, non-orthogonal characteristics that the, the, the software world and the abstraction world don't. It doesn't have. Um, so, uh, anybody know, ever owned a lava lamp? Right, so what happens when you turn it on? Nothing for a while. Well, there's just light, but it takes a while for it to bubble. So, um, the first thing that happened was um, the, one of the little X10 switches had a solenoid in it, and so when it flipped, there was a loud click. And so, you know, everybody knew when the build broke. Oh, man, the build broke. And, well, then, it became a game in the team to try to fix the build before the red lava started bubbling. Right? And it, it really brought the team together and helped them build that ethic in their team of a break, broken build is something we need to jump on right away and get it fixed before we do anything else. So which senses do good programmers make use of? We talk about code smells, and I think code smells is a valuable metaphor, metamore, metaphor. Um, but I don't think we're using the olfactory parts of our brain when we talk about code, code smells. I think this is a pure metaphor. I don't actually smell code. Um, it's a good metaphor because it maps fairly well onto how we feel, uh, but, but I don't think we're using the, the olfactory parts of our brain. I do think we use the visual parts of our brain a lot. I see the code I'm working on. I visualize it in my head. And it's an amazing thing how I can look at a rectilinear array of ASCII characters and read that and in my mind forms this fancy structure that changes over time. And I understand what this means in terms of a running system. And that's one of the reasons why, for me at least, object-oriented systems are easier to deal with than functional systems. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with functional programming and I, I uh, have learned to think that way about solving problems, but I still uh, don't quite yet understand how to visualize and really grok the entire program like I do with an OO system. Um, I think that this characteristic is one of the reasons why, and, and you might think, that making code explicitly visual, like with diagrams, would be a good idea. But 
I, I think that's actually doomed to fail. And I, I think part of the reason is that code is not two-dimensional. It's multi-dimensional. Um, I think the number is larger than three, and I think it's not an integer. I think it code is fractal. You can't represent that on a piece of paper. And one of, the, one of the most horrible things about UML is it locks us into one small slice of how we can see our program and makes it difficult to move between different representations of how we can see our program. Um, there's a very interesting project that somebody's developing right now, I think at Microsoft Re Research, called Code Canvas. That's a way of visualizing code that allows you to rapidly switch between multiple visualizations and zoom in and zoom out and change the level of detail. And that's getting close to the kind of thing that I think might actually help rather than hurt. Hearing. Um, I do think some parts of the same, you know, same kind of thing that we use to process music helps us understand code. I think that... Uh, uh, I see tension in, in code. I see patterns in code. And, and um, I, I think that's probably not using my visual pattern recognition, but m something more like my music pattern recognition. Um, because I, I, don't, I see structure, but I don't see patterns. I kind of feel them. It's almost like I'm hearing them. I've had other conversations with programmers that say the same thing. Kinesthesia is not a true sense in itself, but it's, it's two senses working together, um, touch and proprioception. Um, has anybody ever uh, seen one of those like Japanese puzzle boxes uh, that, where you have to kind of manipulate and slide things in different ways to get it open? And when you first pick it up, it's, it's like it's a solid sealed block of wood. But then you have to figure out how to manipulate it in strange ways. And there's just no way you can work that puzzle by sitting and looking at it and analyzing. You have to push and see what resists and twist. And some, somebody looking at you might think you were just holding it because it's not moving enough, pieces of it don't move enough um, in some cases for you to even see that they move, but you can feel that they move a little bit. Think about when you're working a jigsaw puzzle and you find a piece, okay, that one looks like it would fit here. How do you see if it actually fits? You feel and twist and push. And you can do that part with your eyes closed. And you, you feel the resistance. You ever feel the code pushing back at you? You feel resistance as you try to go down a path? It, it feels like you're, um, you know, I need to go from here to there, and the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, but now that I've started down this path, it feels like there's brambles and obstacles and, and uh, a swamp in the way, and I'm not making good progress. I mean, maybe I need to back up and take a different path. It'll be easier. How many of you feel code pushing back at you? How many of you feel funny talking about that to your teammates? Part of what I'm say, trying to do here is to give you permission to talk about that, because I think that's one part of the thing that makes you a good programmer is that you have um, you've, you've roped in the, the concrete parts of your brain to help you think about abstractions. This isn't a sense either, either in the sense we've been talking about, but think about when we talk about beauty. Let me tell you, all our code is ASCII text, you know, in a file. By any historical standards of beauty, there's nothing beautiful about it. It's just letters. Where does our notion of beauty in code come from? It's because over years of experience, we've seen what works well and what doesn't work well. And then our brains have built an intuition around that. And for lack of any better words, we call what doesn't work well beauty. And we learn to have an aesthetic appreciation for it. And we call what doesn't work well and what we know from experience will get us into trouble, we call that ugly. And then we have a visceral emotional response when we see it, as if it were, you know, uh, something really ugly. How do you cultivate this? If you have it, how did you get it? If you don't have it, how might you start? If you kind of have a little bit of it, but you don't think you're quite there yet, how would you improve? If you're working with a teammate that 
wants to become a better programmer, how do you start cultivating this in them and teaching them to, to think that way? Look for patterns. I don't know the answer to this question, by the way. I have some ideas. So uh, a big part of the, the, this talk is to get people thinking about this. I think you look for patterns. I think it helps to know that this is how good programmers do think about their code so that you know to try to cultivate it and strive for it. I think you, it can come by thinking actively about how you might uh, uh, see patterns and structure and how you might visualize in your mind what's going on in a system uh, so that then you can practice. Perhaps practice outside programming. If you don't have any musical training, maybe you should start. Um, give that part of your brain some exercise that then uh, could, might help you think better about programs. But I think probably most important, and this is where I justify giving this talk at a Ruby conference, is to use tools that help you. Um, uh, Mark McSpadden and I were talking this morning about a craftsman and how um, the tools he uses sort of become like a part of his body and he doesn't think about the hammer. He thinks, you know, you know I'm just gonna, gonna hit this nail and the hammer is like an extension of his arm. Um, how do craftsmen achieve that sense? First of all, I think that's a, a great demonstration of the, the, uh, another aspect of the power of the sensory parts of our brain is that they can sort of build, um, build these models internally that help you integrate uh, a tool into your own sensory system. But the way a craftsman achieves that sense is by practice. And it happens because of the immediacy of feedback when they're using a tool. Things in the real world don't wait to react when you hit them. They react as soon as you hit them. Have you ever noticed how when you're programming, sometimes time seems to disappear and you don't notice the passing of time? I have a theory that, that maybe our, our brains just aren't wired to deal with things that don't react until a second and a half after we do something. And so all that time just sort of gets eluded from our uh, uh, perception of time. You know, I, I issue a command and it takes uh, a second and a half for the response to come back. Well, my brain that's geared for dealing with the real world, um, that, that second and a half of time is lost to my perception of time because uh, you expect the reaction to be instantaneous. Um, you learn better with instantaneous feedback. And I think um, one of the things that has helped me become a better programmer is using a language like Ruby that allows me to play with it and, and see the feedback immediately and shorten that loop so that the time between trying something and learning that it's a bad idea, or that is to say, learning that that should fit into my category that I call ugly, is really fast, and that helps me internalize that learning. Whereas uh, a long uh, compile and, and startup loop stuck in between there, um, it's amazing how little time you have to add to that loop before it stops being effective. Um, so I want to close with a quote from Benoit Mendelbrot. Um, uh, the discoverer of the Mandelbrot set and a lot of, of what we know about chaos and fractal geometry. Um, and this is from James Gleick's book, uh, Chaos. There was a long hiatus of 100 years where drawing did not play any role in mathematics because hand and pencil and ruler were exhausted. That is, they'd gone beyond what you could, could represent that way. They were well understood and no longer in the forefront and the computer did not exist. And Mendelbrot was one of the first people to use the computer as a visualization tool, not merely as a calculating tool in the realm of mathematics. When I came in this game, there was a total absence of intuition. One had to create an intuition from scratch. Intuition, as it was trained by the usual tools, the hand, the pencil, and the ruler, found these shapes, the fractal shapes that he's famous for, quite monstrous and pathological. The old intuition was misleading. Intuition is not something that is given. I've trained my intuition to accept as obvious shapes which were initially rejected as absurd, and I find everyone else can do the same. Experts in any field make their decisions uh, 
as if by pure intuition, by gut. But they weren't born with that intuition. It's something that's developed. And I think we teach programming as you know, too mechanistic, too carefully planned and thought out. And we need to start focusing on learning ways to cultivate the intuition that great programmers have. I'm, I'm a little over time, uh, but I started with uh, two videos about music. And I want to close with two, visit, two videos about uh, sight, and in particular about movie making. Um, and they, they're contrasting uh, two different attitudes towards a craft, and uh, one of which I think represents uh, the wrong way of looking at programming, and one which represents the right way. Um, the first one is a clip from uh, Tim Burton's uh, picture about the life of the director, Ed Wood who uh, directed what's generally regarded to be the worst movie ever made, uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space. And this scene depicts uh, you know, part of the filming of Plan 9. Now why do I always get hooked up with these spook details? Monsters, graves, bodies. You flying saucer? <laughs> Print. We're moving on. That was perfect. Perfect. Uh, Did you notice Wood, the tombstone? Do you know anything about the art of film production? Well, I like to think so. That cardboard headstone tipped over. The, this graveyard is obviously phony. Nobody will ever notice that. Filmmaking is not about the tiny details. It's about the big picture. Take that last sentence and substitute the word architecture for filmmaking. Have you ever heard that sentence before? The, the contrasting clip is from one of the all-time great film directors, um, David Lean, who uh, directed The Bridge Over the, on the River Kwai, Dr. Zhivago, A Passage to India, and one of my favorite movies, Lawrence of Arabia. And um, there's a documentary about the making of Lawrence of Arabia that has an interview with David Lean. And he said something that I, I thought was a great contrast to um, uh, Ed Wood's philosophy. I just love making movies. I have a sort of burst of adrenaline when I get behind a camera. I just love them. I like lenses. I like looking through the camera. I like composing pictures. Nobody had a view of the big picture of his movies like David Lean, and yet he liked being immersed in the details. He liked the lenses. He liked the tools of his craft. And when he's talking about the lenses, you can see him holding his hands. Like he likes holding them and seeing how they work. Um, filmmaking is about the big picture, but it's also about the details. Uh, Stanley Kubrick built his own lenses and had a part, long running partnership with a mach machinist to build specialized cameras to achieve the look he wanted. Um, I think we should avoid tools that take us too far away from the nuts and bolts of our craft. Because I think it's when we, we get down in the trenches and uh, concern ourselves with the details that we really learn how to be better programmers. And so I would just like to encourage everyone to think about how you think about programming. And forget about how you were taught about programming, but think about how you think about programming today and let's start trying to catalog and cultivate and teach those techniques so we can uh, build an industry that has more great programmers and fewer average programmers. I know by the law of mathematics, there'll always be as many average programmers, but you know what I mean. Thank you. <laughs>